Welcome everyone to our panel, what our OSPOs have learned about measuring project health. Um, really excited to uh, be able to moderate this, uh, this wonderful group here. So um, I just thought we would start with introductions. If you could tell us a little bit about like um, who you are, where you come from, how you got here. And uh, we've all met in the context of uh, to the To Do Working Group. Yeah. And um, uh, we often use an, ice an icebreaker. Thank you. An icebreaker in our in our intros. And so the icebreaker that we'd like to start with for today is what kind of music do you listen to when you work? So you want to start? So the intro and the icebreaker at the same time? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm Don Foster. I'm director of open source community strategy at VMware. I'm involved in um, a number of different initiatives. So I'm on the governing board of the Chaos Project, um, which is you know, focused on, on metrics, which is kind of why I'm here. I work in the OSPO at VMware. I'm co-chair of the CNCF Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group. I'm on the board of OpenUK, and I've been doing this open source thing for 20 plus years. Um, so it's been, it's been a great career, and so I, I kind of love it. And the icebreaker question, what kind of music do I listen to when I work? I listen to a lot of instrumental metal, so with Buckethead in heavy rotation, if anybody is familiar with Buckethead. Um, I also listen to a lot of uh, German dance metal because I don't speak any German, so I find the lyrics not distracting because I don't know what they're saying. So that's what I listen to when I work. <laughs> that's a good pro tip. Hi, my name is Emma. I work on Microsoft's Open Source Programs Office. I'm a Principal Technical Program Manager, which is kind of a, a mouthful. Um, I've been at Microsoft for about three years. Previous to that, I was at Mozilla for seven. And I actually came to Mozilla as a contributor. Uh, I was a software engineer for a good decade, but I came to Mozilla under their um, project at the time called WebMaker, which was all about teaching people about technology and I really wanted to teach people about open source. And so that kind of began the transition in my career from engineer to working in OSPO years later and kind of trying to help other people. I also, um, I'm on the to-do group. Uh, as If you're not part of that already, I encourage you to join. It's a great place to meet people and learn how others are involved in, in OSPOs. I also am on the Government of Canada's Open Stakeholder Forum, so I help advise the government on meeting their commitments to open government, which I find very satisfying as trying to make a difference in the world. And for music, I kind of listen to everything, maybe not, not everything, <laughs> but um, it depends on the day and my mood. But when I really want to get stuff done, I listen to cello, like, I'll look into Spotify for like deep cello and that, that's when I'm really, my, my kids literally know, don't go in the room, mom's playing cello. She's trying to get things done, so it's a good question. Oh, I, I got one. Oh, right. Um, drop it. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Sophia Vargas. Um, I'm a program manager in Google's open source programs office and my focus is on research and analytics. I support open source projects, programs, and questions across Google and our internal and external stakeholders. Um, I guess I've been in that role now for three years. Before that, I was in a product support role, and before that, I worked at Forrester Research as a market research analyst. Um, and I feel like at starting in research, I kind of ended up going toward open source because I just I just have more questions. It was just an interesting space for me. So starting in market research, looking at the progression of the data center industry and the technology vendors and open source just kept coming up more and more in, in our own understanding of the landscape and the progression of the landscape. And so I kind of, I don't want to say to follow my nose, but I followed my questions or I just had more questions and that's where I found things that were most interesting. So by 2020, I ended up on the open source team where I got to pursue questions around understanding open source, its role in our company, how we interact with it, and the progression of the role of open source across the industry. So that's kind of how I ended up there, I guess. Um, and in terms of other open sourcey things, I also work with the Chaos community. Uh, I started doing that in, in 2020. Similarly, when I joined the OSPO at Google, 
because uh, one of the things where I was, I was really interested in, in metrics because that was part of my role and it was fun to find community of practitioners. Uh, so I, I found the, a lot of support in that group. Um, and also thought it was just really important to start to participate in open source as a researcher of open source. I think it was kind of an awesome thing to go from being someone who covered data centers and I was never going to be a data center operator as a data center analyst at Forrester. But at Google, I had the opportunity to join a community and participate in an external community. And I thought that was um, a really, one, interesting and two, critical part of under, better understanding it in, in my own research. Um, in terms of music, uh, I kind of have a pretty big split where if I'm doing anything writing related, it cannot have lyrics. So I generally go like full classical, big fan of like Chopin or Rachmaninoff, so like creamy, sad, depressing music. Um, but if I'm doing any sort of like query or logic based work, I kind of go for dance music, kind of something with a hard beat. Like there's this one project where I only listened to Girl Talk for about a month before I finished it. So I feel like it really depends on the kind of work. Um, and that's the music I'll listen to. I love this question. Good question. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to answer that question. So I listen to white noise pretty obsessively. I'm currently listening to um, a rainfall. Um, highly recommended, but uh, keeps me focused. So this is about project health and metrics. Um, so I thought we'd start with the question for you and what you care about. What, what do you think health is? I'm going to start with Sophia with your themes. Um, I guess for health, I like to sort of ask the like, is it behaving like we thought it would question? Because <laughs> you might release open source or contribute to open source projects for a variety of reasons. Um, and those reasons can be anything from I just thought this was cool to I want to start a movement or create a new language. And those things have very different goals and expectations. So the first being or is, is the thing behaving as intended? Are people behaving around it as, as you would have liked? And then once you know what that is, then you have something to measure against it. That was a great answer. I was thinking about that. Um, kind of building on that a little bit, I, when maintainers uh, of open source projects at Microsoft ask our OSPO this question, which happens all the time, is my project healthy? Um, I ask similar questions or I'm starting to ask similar questions. It's like, what is your contribution focus? Who are you hoping to engage around this project? You know, is it users? Uh, are you trying to have user adoption? Are you looking for contribution? Uh, is this like to, to market and increase brand value? So I think first understanding that and then how it aligns to people's business or product strategy. And then basically, are you accomplishing those things? begins to answer, begins to answer the question, but then the second part would be, what is the experience of those people? Are they, do they feel successful? Um, do they feel safe when they're collaborating on your project? And, um, and then that's just a cycle. It's not, you know, who's your collaborator? You know, what's the business proposition? Are people happy and feel safe? Is something to continually revisit? I see it like, I think about the recycle symbol, you know, that being for open source. Yeah, and just everything they said. So to build on that, um, you know, when I when I think about health, um, I always I always like to think about trends, right? So is is the thing that you're looking at getting better along however you want to define better? And so you know, I try to look at health like there's as far as I'm concerned, there's no there's no such thing as a project that is healthy across the board. There are parts of the project that are probably more healthy than others. And so the idea being that if you look across a bunch of things that you care about and look at the trends across those things, um, how, how are the trends going? Are things improving or are things declining? And, and the metrics help tell you what to do about that. And so why should we collect or care about project health? Yeah, so I think it's I think it's super important to care about project health because um, I mean obviously if we're if we're working on things we want them to be we want them to be improving we want them to be getting better we want to be able to measure whether or not we're achieving what we set out to achieve with a particular project. I guess I, to add on that I think as someone who's been working with various projects on this it's I liked your comment. Um, about it being a cycle. I don't think this work is ever done. And I think 
working with projects and understanding their health also forces the project leaders to remember what they what they want to accomplish because we, we might have started with a particular goal but that goal can change over time and so by creating or revisiting a metrics program or how we're defining and measuring health it's also revisiting what we're trying to achieve in this community with this project what we're investing in because those those goals change over time and so this I like that this exercise sort of forces you to think about that again and acknowledge how if, if you're actually still on the same path or we need, do we need to revisit what you're looking at as health and how we're thinking about it? I, I would just add, I was just trying to think about the, the milestones on a cycle. One of the things that we try to emphasize also is that communication upwards within your organization that describes that health and the value that it's creating and then outwards towards your community, letting them know, you know, where your time is invested, the things you care about so that, you know, they don't necessarily waste time on things that, that might not be, you know, accepted as a pull request. You know, just keeping that communication open uh, is really important and, and is part of health. And I think it's important to have healthy projects kind of for obvious reasons, but also I feel like it's a flag or it's, it's a good um, prompt for when to not end an open source project, but to recognize when your priorities have changed, your resources have changed, and to make decisions at that point in time about well, what happens next. And that's not always about continuing to invest in health. It might be transitioning to a community member. It might be archiving it and, you know, making, like, encouraging people to fork or whatever it is. So um, it's important, but it's also important to recognize when it's not a priority anymore. So for Osbos that might be out here at OspoCon, um, and artists perhaps starting in this idea of collecting a project metric, how, how, how would you, what are some guidelines you might have us think about or what to look for when, when thinking about um, metrics for projects that we are publishing to the open source? You know, from, from my perspective, I tend, I tend to try to take a more strategic approach, right? So I try to look at what is not just the OSPO, but what is the whole organization trying to achieve? And then how do the efforts with our open source projects fit into that? Because if you can talk to your executives about the things that they care about, the things they're being measured on, the strategies and objectives that they have, and talk to them about how your open source efforts fit into that and support the work that the rest of the organization is doing, then it feels like you're in a much better better position as an OSPO. So, so you would recommend starting there in terms of? Yeah, I try to start like, like big picture and then kind of work my, way, work my way through it, but making sure that the work that we do as an OSPO supports whatever the, whatever the goals of the overall organization are. Because if you fundamentally, if you don't do that, then, um, and I've seen lots of OSPOs do this and, and describe the work that they're doing in a way that sounds an awful lot like charity to executives. Um, and when you do that, as soon as there's a downturn in the economy, um, you're, you're something they can cut, right? Because it's, it's not essential work. It's not important to the business. So if you can describe the work that you do in a way that shows it's important to the business, then you're more likely to be able to continue to do it. That is all true. Um, I would, I would just, I mean, I would just add on to say like how I've approached this specifically in our OSPO is, is definitely to like align the types of metrics that we are encouraging people to use with a business strategy, but also. Um, so for me, what's that meant? What that's meant is taking one or two. So. W w Two of the things that we've taken recently are the OpenSSF scorecard value. So security obviously matters, getting maintainers and engineers to understand where they fit in the standard is a great tool for also speaking up to decision makers and showing the impact of, of that work. Um, some others have been things like security response time, uh, completing a code of conduct course because the safety of employees and their ability to respond to situations is very important and that's something you can speak to employment legal type folks um, and there's there's a number from there but I'm saying experiment I think it's really important to pick one or two and experiment there than to put up a big dashboard 
and, and there might be some hidden gold in there, but, but it's better to focus on a couple. That's been my experience. I agree with both of those, those comments and perspectives. I think what's been helpful for some of our teams is focusing on specific goals and whether or not it's something like improving responsivity to external contributors or looking at how we're evaluating productivity in these public spaces versus looking at our internal metrics of productivity against our own engineering practices and tools. Um, we also, I, I like metrics a lot as a way to evaluate the success of programs and initiatives. Say you want to try to grow your community. Now we explicitly contract that over time. And so if you have something set up in place, then that's a great way to see, are we actually making progress against those goals? Are we actually do, uh, impacting anything <laughs> uh, or making a change in our community? So having the alignment with the business and having those goals explicitly allows you to look for those things. But um, within that, we like to, I like to kind of encourage a specific focus just because it can be pretty broad sometimes. Um, and then sort of as a second layer to that, what, what we've attempted to do is because there's quite a large portfolio of projects and teams at Google, um, is to try to connect our internal community a bit more. Um, we've had some projects that are approaching similar initiatives on, say, improving our like issue triage rate in the community, recognizing that we have, I don't know, maybe multiple issue systems internally and externally, and so it's a little bit messy sometimes. So um, how are the ways that we're measuring improvement against uh, that to ensure that external members are achieving the same kind of experience and responsiveness, but then being able to say, oh wait, another team is doing that, and being able to connect them, and they can learn from each other and learn what's worked well um, between them. So I think as OSPO, we can't always do all the things, but we can serve as a connector within the organization, um, because we, we individually talk to all these project teams, and so it's been really helpful to be able to say, oh, you should do a talk to this team. They're doing something really similar. They can tell you what's worked well for them and what hasn't worked well and how they've had to adjust their program, um, because that's gonna be a lot more real versus me kind of giving it giving them that story, but I also like, I didn't do all the things, so I think it's better better to have them talk to each other. You just reminded me of something. <laughs> um, I, I think a role in, of OSPOs, at least one of the roles that I find myself taking is also teaching maintainers how to use metrics for their project house. There's a lot of things that I look at from the strategic point of the company, but you know, something I might hear a lot from a maintainer is I'm doing this on the side of my desk, you know, they, there's, there's all these PRs being opened. How to use a metric like new contributors uh, to identify folks that might be really interested in stepping into a role like triage, you know, the, the GitHub triage role. So helping them connect with one or two metrics that help the immediate pain points that they're having, I think is also an opportunity that also has to do that teaching and and uh, yeah, each each one teach one, something like that. And so then how would you uh, give advice for people who are looking to um, get metrics around the health of the projects that they're in, bringing into the company, open source projects that they are ingesting? So that was about like publishing open source. What does ingestion look like? I can start. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. So there's 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 a lot of things that we look at when when we're looking at you know especially if we're looking at incorporating a particular open source project into a piece of our own technology, so into a product that we might ship. Um, there are there are a lot of things that we look at. You know, Emma mentioned the um, OSSF scorecard. So that is something that we, we tend to run on those uh, projects, and we look at whether, you know, are they keeping up with security vulnerabilities, they have branch protection, like there's a whole series of things that, that we look at as part of the scorecard. I look at who controls the project. Is it owned by, is it owned by a company? Are they a competitor of ours? Are they the only other user of this piece of software? Or is it you know, under a neutral foundation where there are loads of people participating, lots of adopters from lots of companies, um, you know, who are the people contributing to it? Does does the community look healthy? There, there are a lot of things that I that I try to look at across some of those projects, especially if it's something that is relatively important that we're looking at incorporating. Um, you haven't mentioned it yet, but licensing. But maybe, well, in terms of like one of the most fundamental things we have to consider, just if, if whether or not what we want to use is going to be able to be used properly internally. Mm -hmm. um, and at OSPO, we're kind of on the hook to ensure that we are using all licenses properly. So to kind of limit that, we usually have a set guideline of things you can and can't use. 
Um, and if you want to use things that are not on that list, then you have to go through our team at a full consultation so they understand the ramifications of what that means for them and how to continually apply with licenses that require, require more things than just usage. Mm -hmm. Plus all the things that Don said. So we, have a, we actually have quite a bit of tooling to help us flag um, software we're using that if they have any sort of vulnerabilities or risk associated with them. So a lot of that is in our tooling, including licensing, and that will send flags. So we have a business review program. So if there's a concern raised through the tooling, and I can't remember the name, we have released this specific library, which I will try and remember and post later that you can use to do the same. Um, then it goes through a business review process, it'll be flagged, and then we'll bring in legal to review that. And we have been historically looking for business reviewers, like within the organizations to help review that, but we're moving even away from that. We don't have a use and not use list. Um, Microsoft's come a long way. They used to be afraid of open source, and it's really less so. So it's more about those automation triggers and then putting a person on it when we need it. No specific metrics other if, than... Would you say that the health of, the metrics that you're using to evaluate health of projects that you're publishing into the open source are different than the metrics that you're using for the ingestion of open source? Like where is the overlap? Is that for all of us? Yes, oh, yeah. for <laughs> everyone. Please, please go, yeah. uh, I would say they are different. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think that definitely things that are when we're releasing things out into the community, there's just so many more considerations that you have to have in terms of our own perpetual involvement in the project and what we what we want to see that's what we want to see happening, um, and the choices that we make in order to do that and recognize it. And yet, it doesn't end after you release it. <laughs> um, and understanding what that what that ongoing commitment might look like and trajectory um, versus, I think, understanding our our other policies internally restrict what we can apply on things that we, that we bring into the company. And so that list is a bit shorter and more just practical, again, based on license, based on security and risk in that sense. Um, but then also say limiting the number of versions that come in um, so that we know exactly what we have at any point in time um, to kind of reduce the risk by, again, policy versus trying to go back and check everything. Um, and so because of that, there's a little bit, there's less criteria, but more harder to, to get around criteria on the ingestion piece than when we release something, maybe we'll have a, a broader perspective and a more community-based perspective. Yeah, I would just say the same on release. And we're especially, it, especially mindful in asking people to have goals for their project. Again, collaboration goals, who they want to collaborate with is kind of a, a repetitive thing, but um, it's a good check and balance you know, to, to give people th those questions because they might not have thought of that or some people might think of open source as a way to get, you know, so that I can do something with this project that I don't have time for, people will help me and getting people to, you know, have a set of uh, questions that they ask themselves and goals is a really part of our, important part of our release process as well. So I'll just kind of echo that. Yeah, we, we spend a lot of time talking to internal teams who want to release something into open source to make sure that they're really doing it for the right reasons. Because you do have a lot of people with sort of naive um, impressions of how open source works. Um, so they think they're, you know, they're gonna do this for marketing. And you know, they don't think about the fact that this is, this is a long-term commitment that they're making on behalf of VMware. And so we really try to make sure that that we're doing these things for the right reasons and that the people are going to be around to maintain them and that they actually, you know, want them to continue over over a long period of time. Uh, last question and then I thought I'd open it up to the audience. Um, what's the one thing you want to highlight about metrics for, for the crew here? And Emma, you should go first because you haven't gone oh. first yet. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm just thinking how to frame it. Um, so, Metrics are a great tool, but you're still, whether you're talking to decision makers, you're working with maintainers, this is a human problem um, in that in that asking someone to do something for the sake of something, you know, have collaboration rules for your project because I'm an expert and I'm telling you you should have that, or telling a decision maker that it's very important to contribute to the upstream. Those are difficult conversations, and I think, or what I've learned is, and I did a talk yesterday at KSCon, I call them curiosity hooks. I try and use data and metrics to get people to ask more questions that will influence their decision making 
in their kind of alignment with our work. So um, I'm trying to give an example. So saying that contributions to the upstream are important, um, a decision maker might already believe that, but showing them the data, for example, this team contributed X number of upstream contributions which impacted 300 internal projects, right? That's, that's data that we're able to pull out recently and that it doesn't necessarily, it's not about convincing, but it gets them asking more questions and better questions and making your conversation richer with more potential. So trying to get people curious about your work instead of trying to approach people as not understanding, because often they do or they have some insights into it, giving them the curiosity through metrics. So here's a metric for this and here's how it turns up with our business. More often than not, you'll get more questions than asking people or trying to pitch something. So I think that's the, the one thing that I've learned and I'm continuing to explore. So that's just an early kind of aha moment for me and I'm continuing to, to um, explore that. Continue to be curious. Yeah, I think, I think for me, the, the most important part of thinking about metrics is, is being able to tie them back to uh, strategy. So, you know, what are you trying to achieve and how do you pick a few metrics that show whether or not you're successful? So by, by picking a few metrics that people, that people care about that show, you know, whether or not you're helping the organization achieve their goals, I think can be a really good place to start. Um, I think both of those are excellent recommendations and I, I feel like I would love to have you, someone like you, Emma. <laughs> so I feel like I, I'm often in the case where I'm trying to support too many teams at once. And so being able to create curated examples of how hooks to get people interested. I just, I am often not in that role. I'm often in the step four where I'm trying to make sure that the project leaders have that information to bring to their higher ups, which generally puts me in a position to have more generalized information that I can share with more teams. Um, but that's also sometimes problematic because how many, how many failed dashboards have you seen? I've personally seen many of just like you find, oh wait, there's a dashboard for that, that all the data hooks are now dead because nobody maintained it because nobody looked at it. And it's just kind of this constant cycle where we try to use dashboards as a way to create generalized information for a team to come in and use it to create these stories. Um, and often it, they just aren't serving enough people with the right things. And so I feel like something that I've been attempting to do now is because I'm, I'm sort of in this middle place versus being that person is trying to find those people within a team, trying to find who, who is going to make the best use of this. And then I will support them on what they need because I know they know how to curate this in a way that helps them inform their programs, their strategy, and how to communicate that to their managers. So I'm, I'm in more of that encouragement role where I, I wish there, I wish I had time to do that, but I don't because I'm supporting too many projects. So um, I'm sort of now in the place where how do I find the right person and then I will design to their needs because if I try to do something that's too generalized, I run the risk that it serves nobody's needs. <laughs> um, so how do I kind of meet them in the middle? So I feel like finding, finding, the, finding your design point is, is really helpful um, for any of these sorts of exercises. Um, and I always feel like anytime you, you start publishing data around a project, I'm always curious about what are we inadvertently encouraging? <laughs> Um, what kind of behavior are we incentivizing by showing a ranked list of contributors inside yeah. a community? Are we encouraging behavior that we want or are we encouraging things that we don't want? And I think being cognizant of anytime you do share information or share anything that's sort of real time like that of, of what are the broader implications of publishing this information um, and ensuring that you're encouraging the things that you want because it is an incredible tool to encourage and incentivize behavior, um, but it could also easily incentivize things that you didn't plan for. Very good point. Mm -hmm. uh, great, thank you. I thought we'd open it up to the audience. Um, are there any questions from, from the audience? Yeah. I got a quick question, I'm pretty loud. Do we, so sorry, we have a live stream. So do we, do we have another mic for questions? Okay, come on. We can repeat it. Yeah, I can. All right. I'll just hand it to her. Yeah, so if you ask a question, you got to come up, take a microphone. Okay. Okay. Hello. 
<laughs> um, so I have a really quick question. So I really enjoyed uh, your panel on metrics and what things that we are measuring impact and all of those particular different sorts of spaces and caveats. Now in the current climate that we are living in within a, I'll just gonna call it a transitory sort of job functions that are happening, right? What sort of things should we display, share, emphasize to help our case to keep our jobs, right? That's kind of what I was thinking of. If that, I hope that. Well. I think it's a question on everyone's minds. Um, so, I guess I'm talking first accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the answer. I think would be the first one. My hunch is, can, you know, a lot of Dawn, especially emphasizing strategic alignment. I think has never been more important. And for me, that's security, especially. So like, however we can show that impact on uh, like strategy, but also security and be able to speak to the top line goals of the organization, I think is probably most important. Um, I'm also stubborn in some things, like for me, safety and open source and psychological, physical, that's really important and I'll never entire, like I won't sway from that. and. I think, I think in that way, that doesn't have to put you at risk though. I think you just need to work at finding your allies within the organization and that that work aligns with their strategic goals so that you move from being, I mean, our OSPA works across the company, but it's really important to have those organizational partners that will speak to your work for you and you know collaborate with you on whatever those solutions may be. So those are the two things that come to mind. I feel like I'm just going to echo what Don has been saying, but I feel like the ideal will be if you start this work with business strategy and alignment in mind and your case is already made. I think there's definitely been scenarios where I've been brought in to help justify work where if they had only done this exercise before they started it, then we would just be proving that they're making their own case versus how do I justify business value for something that I never actually developed a strategy around to begin with. Um, and that's where things start to get a little bit sticky because we have to go in and figure out what that is and that may or may not be direct to the company. So then, it, then we have to figure out, well, what story do we tell? Are you working on patches upstream that directly impact product features and functionality and conformance? Or are we generally trying to ensure the sustainability of an ecosystem? We're working generally on Python, even though we don't use that particular package. Or So it's kind of trying to find the connection back to why it's relevant for either your company or your customers, um, if something you stop supporting, who's it, who's it gonna break? And, and that's maybe the, 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 like, the inverse case is always the most awkward thing to talk about, but um, I always like to look at, well, like, what happens if we stop? If you stop doing this work tomorrow, who's gonna be most impacted by it? Is there, can we point to potential loss in revenue, potential loss in functionality um, that would be the result of stepping back and stepping away from this particular community function or role? Um, and if you don't have a strong case to make, then, then the question is, are, is this work actually aligned with the business? And maybe it is something that should, should be removed, um, which is always uncomfortable with something you've been doing for a while. But ideally, you can translate to another role in the company that could still serve that function and just would be more aligned. Um, and I think because we're all a bit strapped with all kinds of cash, <laughs> um, <laughs> that I, I think it, we are going to see a narrowing and a focus of prioritization. But I think. The, the thing that I've really been pushing on is again, like we, we talked about this a lot yesterday, but like we can't be too narrowly focused on what we think we use and the recognizing that all these pieces are interconnected. Um, and so even if the relationship is indirect, pulling away or pulling out of say like community building functions in a project is only gonna detract from the health of that community. And so even if you're not thinking about that, you're only thinking about the technical piece that you use, um, you have to kind of, if, if your managers don't understand that you have to educate them on the value of the health of the entire project and ecosystem and people um, that are all part of that. And I think sometimes it does require some storytelling, which is, I think, where OSPO hopefully comes in handy because we, we can help other projects build that story, build that case, and help them articulate that value if it's there. Because <laughs> um, it might not always be. Yeah, and I, you know, I think just to, to build on that, I think I think that you really do need to be laser focused on business value, 
um, when you talk about the work that you're doing to, especially to senior executives. Now that doesn't mean that you don't do some of those chop wood, carry water kind of tasks within the community. You do, you continue to do those, but those are the things you do while you're waiting for a PR to merge, while you're waiting for something else to happen. Um, that's not how you describe it to the executives. And so I would just say be really, really careful about how you describe the work that your open source program office does when you're talking to the people that get to decide whether or not you continue to do the work. Other questions? Come on up. Cool, I thank you guys. Um, I wanna know some specific example of whether retired or failed metrics uh, on an either upcoming or scaling process of an open source project in particular, and why you retire them more, you realize it was a failed uh, metrics. So failed metrics or failed project? Uh, metrics, yeah. Oh, failed metrics. Failed metrics. I feel like you talked about this a lot in your chaos talk yesterday. Oh, okay. You well, see what, I, you know what I mean? Approaches, I mean. Yeah, that's true. I have a failed metric. Um, well, it's more that like, um, I, and Don knows the story because I've told it a few times, but um, I, when you don't have full awareness of project processes and tooling, sometimes you think that something's a good metric and you say look at response times and close rates a lot or, or really popular ones or time-based metrics. Um, and then if you apply the amount of pull requests or issues that are closed in a project to the Kubernetes project where CI robot closes everything, <laughs> suddenly you realize your numbers don't make any sense. Um, and so recognizing yeah, that if you, don't, if you don't understand the sort of tooling and process of a project, some metrics are just not gonna work in those cases because they, they don't make sense because there's active automation that's going to really muck up your numbers. Um, in other cases, it was, um, I was looking at a lot of uh, activity-based metrics in terms of how many events were people creating um, and trying to trying to gauge it in terms of amount, like not say amount work, like work done in the community or productivity in the community, and just kind of get a general volume of work. Um, and year over year, I was looking at it. There was a couple of people that were just having outrageous numbers of push events. Um, and so I just, because I have their username, went reached out and it found out that all of that was automation. <laughs> Um, so again, robots, um, really, really messing up some of the numbers that I thought were uh, quality measures of amount of time spent on open source. None of them actually were, uh, as in because I didn't, we, these weren't even labeled under automated accounts. I was removing bots. I was looking at people-based accounts, and there were still scripts running and duplicating and causing a whole lot of noise. Um, and so I stopped actually using almost all of my activity accounts. Um, and I use them to, to think about like kinds of work or diversity in work or engagement level because I don't want to catch things like watch events. So I still consider event type, but um, I'm now mostly looking at how much how much a person is spending in that. So like how many days is that person active, or how many days in a month are they active, or how many months in a year are they active, versus looking at their activity counts in any of those given moments because I I can't actually tell whether or not the activity was hands on keyboard or something they wrote six months ago. Yeah, I have, I have an example from, um, there. I, I knew a bunch of people that worked on an open source team at a uh, very large company, and um, their head office liked to measure numbers of commits. So the developers were measured on number of commits to open source projects, and their boss would get a call if their numbers of commits dropped or um, changed in some way. Um, so this is a terrible metric, but what it encouraged them to do was just everything's a commit. I've changed one line, that's a commit. I've changed one other thing, that's a commit. So it just encouraged all of this really bad behavior uh, among their engineers um, by measuring their performance on number of commits, which is a ridiculous measure. So similar story for lines of code. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, lines of code. Yeah. We don't use that one. Yeah, no lines of code. Or not no, but. I mean, not the I feel like some, some lines of code are good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the only thing that I would say is um, as assumption that people understand the value of the metrics you're proposing and that the value will bring them out of the gate in the talk that I did. I just, you know, have brought metrics to people to suggest them, but that's not, again, it's like bringing them something to be curious about. Oh, I saw your, you know, your repository had X number of, you know, whatever your metric is, is a much better 
more successful way of having a conversation. The bots is a great one. Um, I was really glad to learn about that. I can't think of specific. It's for me, it's always approaches. Different approaches work different ways. And uh, but I think the Chaos Project is a great one to visit if you're looking to learn about what metrics people are trying, failing, improving on. I think that's one of the great things. It's a really great community if you're not already checking in. I feel like I want to amend my lines of code one because it wasn't necessarily we discontinued it. It's more sometimes you think you propose a metric for a thing, but then it turns out it's a better measure of something else. So it's also not necessarily requiring a metric, but repurposing it. So I ended up like looking at lines added, lines removed as the amount of churn in a project, because that can kind of just tell you how much is the code base changing over time. And that is actually something interesting to measure to know whether or not this is stabilizing or there's a lot of active change happening, which maybe if you're thinking about project life cycle, that's something interesting to pay attention to at any given time. So we didn't like it as a productivity measure because clearly we all know the case where removing lines can sometimes meet a more efficient efficient progress versus something that had a lot of extraneous extra things in it. But, um, but instead repurposing it for something that was more, more valuable to the metric or more aligned to what that metric could tell us. I love that because in accessibility, there's the curbside effect, right? Where with the curb dip in the sidewalk was created for wheelchairs would end up working for strollers and buggies and that kind of thing. I like that that is, that is true. It's part of metrics is really about learning. So learning works for something else makes so much sense. Any other questions? Come on up. We got two. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, when is it? It's 6.50? I assumed it was 3.40, but oh. anyways. We're having too much fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last question. Uh, That'd be good. So no I'm, I'm a, more like an open source maintainer. Not. I don't work for... I don't actually, I didn't even know about OSB as proposed before today. Um, but uh, as an open source maintainer, I guess I'm curious, like, what non obvious advice would you give to someone like myself who doesn't necessarily think about the role of your jobs in your organizations, but it's actually obviously very important that you guys exist to be able to make sure that my projects can be used in those organizations? Um, so obviously, there's metrics. Maybe the non-obvious thing is just, here's the list of metrics. Um, but I'm just curious what your, your advice would be. Is that, a, as a maintainer, what you'd want, um, what an organization that you are working for as a maintainer would want, or as a maintainer of like an open source project that other companies use? Like, I'm, let's say I'm an independent project. Independent, OK. Not related to your company. Got it. I'm going to think on that as usual. Or someone else, so. um, I, I think it depends, right? So I, I think um, I think metrics can be useful as a way to to understand what's working well in your project and what's not, and how that might be perceived by companies. So, for example, you know, if you look at you know the ratio of of closed pull requests, for example, do you do you have like is there a big pile of open pull requests that nobody's dealt with or a big pile of issues that nobody's dealt with? That's, that's not going to look good for a company when they come and look at it. Do you have a whole bunch of security vulnerabilities that were never patched is another thing that the companies are going to look at. So that's another, another thing that you can, that you can measure. Um, and then there are some things that may work against you that you can't control. So are you a sole maintainer of a project and you're the only one working on it? That's a big risk to a company like me to adopt it. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I mean, there's some metrics you can you can look at, but then I think there's also some maybe less tangible things that you can think about too. Um, this isn't really a, a metrics one, um, but something that I look for if I'm involved is sort of has the project or say the person who's maintaining the project have they published their explicit goals of what they're trying to achieve in the project. Um, is this something that they, they want adoption, they want contribution, or maybe they don't? Like, I think some projects are just out there to be experimentations or demos, and they won't, they won't accept patches, and they won't. And it's sort of understanding what you want from us, too, in terms of, like, what are you trying to achieve with it, as well as expectations of how best to engage with you as the maintainer. Um, I think that's something that 
um, I feel like I felt fairly acutely not, not involved in this, but seeing how some companies have approached maintainers with the sort of expectation that they're there to respond to their needs and these piece fix this bug or this issue or this patch, not recognizing that that person is there in a volunteer capacity or in a hobby role. Um, and part of that is, okay, maybe those companies should have known better. But on the other hand, I, I want, I've been encouraging maintainers to be more open about how they would like to engage or not engage with their user populations. How do you want to know about bugs or issues? Do you want it on your project? Do you want it on Stack Overflow? Flow, where like where do you go to get that and where's the where's the best way that we can respect your expectations and your processes in the project and know how to engage with you in a way that meets your needs and your expectations versus just assuming you're going to be there on github responding to my bugs or issues um, so that's something that I, I feel like I would, I would love to see us get to that point just because I feel like there is a lot of misaligned expectations in open source between both creators and consumers. Um, and so the more that we can be just upfront and transparent about how how we want things to happen and how we want to engage, um, then hopefully we can incur better practices across company and user and maintainer relationships. Can I echo that? One quick echo on that is the experience that I had actually, uh, first of all, communication, putting it in the readme, all those things that um, you just heard. We had one team that was trying to contribute to an open source project. They really wanted to do everything right, and, and the maintainer wasn't responding, and they you know, they were asking if they could fork it because we try and avoid hard, you know, hostile forks, that kind of thing. And when I went into research, also I can't say enough about qualitative research. You know, we're talking a lot about quantitative, but um, reaching out and it, you know, it's just a student that it, you know, was on their side project and they couldn't really respond. It wasn't that they didn't want to and they were really surprised when they looked, you know, so there's just a lot of, but, you know, maybe he could have put, I'm a student, I will check on this once a month and then, it, you know, then this team's not worried about forking because they're trying to meet a goal. Like it was very stressful and the team was trying to do everything they could, but so plus one on the communication, but that's a, a real story of it being confusing. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and if you want to join the conversation, we have a regular working group where we have these types of conversations. And otherwise, the GitHub link is on the slide. Um, please join us.